Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Beyond the Gate Radio, where we take you each week beyond the gate. Tonight, your hosts are myself, David Baker, and my lovely wife, Sherelle. Sherelle, how are you doing tonight? Actually, I'm doing well, thank you. Um, it's raining here, but that's okay. Um, it needs to wash away all the soot out of the air and everything, so I'm doing great. How are you doing? Wonderful. Yes, the rain is wonderful cleansing energy. We appreciate that. God has given us many gifts, and that is one of them. And without water, we wouldn't be here today. So our show next Sunday, I want to get this out of the way briefly, is going to be medium Charles A. Phileas. Charles Phyllis is a psychic medium. He's the author of On the Wing and a Prayer, and he's also a comedian and cartoonist. And some of his work is on display at the Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, California. Tonight's guest, which everybody's been waiting for, I can see that there's a lot of people listening to the show at this time, is none other than Chip Coffey, Psychic Medium, starring on TV Psychic Kids and a Paranormal State. Thousands of people worldwide have turned to Chip Coffey in their time of need. Chip Coffey is a clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient psychic, as well as a fully conscious medium. He is the great-grandson of famed Native American medicine woman, Minnie Sue Morrow Foster, whose own amazing gifts were widely hailed in the early part of the 20th century. Chip is blessed to have the God-given ability to provide others with insight guidance, and direction. As a medium, he is also able to reconnect his clients with loved ones who have crossed over. A firm believer in God and his angels, Chip believes that miracles great and small happen each and every day. And isn't that true? I like the saying that Chip has on his website, which is chipcoffee.com, Right at the top there, it says, no fear, no doubt. And, you know, I find that to be uh, a very powerful statement in this type of work that we do. And now I'd like to bring on our very special guest tonight, Chip Coffey. Chip, good evening, sir. How are you doing? And welcome to the Beyond the Gate Radio. David, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And hello, Sherelle. Thank you, Chip. Hi. Welcome to the show. How's it going out there? You know, I'm sitting at home in Atlanta, and it's a lovely evening. Um, I must admit that we turned our clocks ahead this morning, and all of us, or most of us did, and uh, here in the U.S., and this time change when we spring forward kind of messes with my internal alarm clock a bit, so I don't know what time my internal alarm clock feels like it is right now, but certainly not 9 o'clock on the East Coast. That's true. That's true. I, I, it takes me like an extra day to get it together. Oh, it takes me longer than that. It usually takes me at least a few days to adjust to, you know, my, my system to the fact that, you know, the, the, the time and the light has all changed around a bit, and, you know, there's a difference in, in the rhythm and the pattern of the way that the day moves along. So, you know, I, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm kind of hypersensitive to that. You know, that's funny you should mention that. I don't know if it's my Gemini energy or myself, but not only did I have to go through the ch time change at work last night, somebody said, oh, so-and-so's not getting a lunch because the time went forward. I said, oh, I'll just give it to him anyway. But I actually went out to check the mail today because my days off just recently changed as well. And I, I came back into the rain I, all wet and I said, what an idiot. Today is not Saturday, it's Sunday. So I'm really discombobulated, but it's okay. I know. I, it happens like that to me sometimes because the days of the week blend in together, and I don't know. Sometimes I'll say, wow, this feels like a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Sunday or something like that. And I don't know what that's supposed to feel like, but in my own mind, I know that there are people that say that, wow, this doesn't feel like a Monday, this doesn't feel like a Friday. You know, so it's really funny how we say those sorts of things in this life. It certainly and, is. And I just want to mention one thing briefly to all the listeners thank you very much for listening to our show tonight all of you are very important to us and tonight we won't be taking any calls because 
Chip has been kind enough to uh, spend an hour of his precious time with us tonight, and we're going to make the very best of it. So once again, no calls, but you are welcome to listen. Thank you very much. And Chip, I want to ask you a question, if I may. For those that don't know a lot about you, or as far as your history goes, do you recall when you first discovered that you had some type of unusual abilities? Actually, my first memory as a child of what I guess I've come to know as psychic ability was very simple precognitive things such as knowing when the telephone was going to ring sometimes or being aware that someone was headed to our house for a visit when they were unannounced, they didn't announce themselves. So that was kind of the first recollection that I had as a child, a very small child, two or three years old, of knowing those sorts of things kind of intuitively. That's amazing. So you were born with the gift and you've had it all your life and it wasn't, did you, you feel that was normal? I know it runs in your family. Did you have anybody that would, uh, that you could talk to about that as you grew older? You mentioned my great grandmother. That was my maternal great grandmother, my mom's grandmother that was uh, a Native American medicine woman and shaman. And she died many years before I was born. But my mother also had some, some unique psychic abilities. Um, my grandmother on my dad's side, on the opposite side of the family, actually read tea leaves. So, you know, when they had a child that exhibited or manifested some evidence of, of having some sort of psychic ability or psychic gift, if you will, then they really weren't too thrown by that. Um, as I began to get older, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, by that time we had moved back to the state where I was born in New York from South Carolina where I was living at the time. And my mother had a dear friend whose name was Jane, and Jane was very in tune with spirituality and, and metaphysics and, and the supernatural. And she was a lady who read a deck of regular playing cards and was also a handwriting analyst. And she was very instrumental in, in encouraging me to explore that psychic part of myself further and to read and study on different on different um, types of abilities and, and read the biographies and the histories of different people who had worked in that, th these realms. As well as my parents, my parents were always very supportive. They didn't have a problem with their belief systems incorporating, you know, anything that was anything that was paranormal. That's that's truly amazing. And you know, something I have found to be true: there are many people that choose to use their gifts in different ways. And I've never said that one is better than the other or just because one psychic medium or psychic does one thing differently than another that they're better than the other. It's just that everybody have different ways of using the gift, such as you said, with through tea leaves or cards or whatever method they may use. And I suppose cards, you mentioned playing cards they weren't tarot or oracle cards, they were just playing cards. I suppose that when people do readings that way, it gives the sitter a visual effect, but in addition, I suppose they can concentrate or it gives them a tool for concentration to go beyond whenever they're doing the uh, reading with the cards. Right. Uh, it, it's, it, with Jane, she was very, you know, I, she just had a deck of regular, it was interesting, she had a deck of regular playing cards and she would just slip out the cards and they're on the table uh, in front of you and you know it was it was pretty amazing the things that she was able to to tell you and I mean pretty exact things that were were pretty on target as far as you know what you, what had happened to you where you had been what was happening in the present what was happening down the road for you it was you know it was it was kind of startling and especially to you know a 10 11 12 year old boy that she was able to to have this level of accuracy, but what I viewed as, you know, a 52 card deck of, you know, bicycle playing cards. That's amazing. That, that's a lot of cards. Yes. Yeah. I've used uh, Oracle cards and I've studied the tarot a bit, but myself, I've gotten away from the cards because at Expos, I've done lots of readings, and when I released my book one time, I used the cards there for visualization, but we had so many people for readings for a few days. I had to toss them aside. I don't even know why I used them in the first place, but because they slowed me down. But you know, for 
small, intimate readings, sometimes people ask for the cards, and you really can't focus quite a bit well, on the cards. I think that people like prompts. They like to see things. You know, I think that's what they look at it as. It's almost like a prop or a crutch for, for a lot of people. They want to see that visual. And, you know, for me, I certainly know how to read tarot cards, and I, you know, I have several decks, and other decks of cards, oracle cards, angel cards, you know, um, gypsy witch fortune-telling cards that are kind of a cute little deck, but, you know, do I have to use those sorts of things? No, I don't. Those are pretty much just something that if a person wants me to flip some cards for them and read some cards, I certainly am not going to say no in most instances, but... Uh, it's not necessary for me to, to have that sort of, of divination tool in order to, to read a person. Yes, I totally agree on that. And I was wondering, you know, as far as gifts go, a lot of people have psychic abilities at different levels. And somebody that's practicing psychic is not necessarily a medium, but a medium is a psychic as well as a medium. Do you agree that perhaps some mediums are just awesome psychic mediums and some mediums might be better mediums than they are psychics? I would have to agree with that. I, I've always gone by the old saying that all mediums are psychic, but not all psychics are mediums. It's kind of like the way I look at it is it's kind of like the next evolutionary level or, you know, like the difference between being in junior high school and high school or high school and college or whatever. You know, it's an advanced sort of a, a, a skill set. Perhaps, you know, although it, or a different skill set, let's just put it that way. Um, it's, it's, it's an addition, in addition to the psychic stuff, if you have the ability to connect with other realms. Um, I've seen some amazing psychics some, that, that have done great work that don't profess to be, have mediumistic abilities or be mediums. And, you know, I, Particularly on the television show, I think people got the wrong interpretation of this. On the television show, um, Ghost Whisperer, the character on Ghost Whisperer said, I'm a medium, but I'm not a psychic. I can't tell things about the future. I can't feel things. Well, I've never known a medium that also didn't possess psychic ability. Yes, I, I find that true. I really do. And I was going to ask you something about that. It's like a stepping stone, right? Right, David? It's like a stepping stone to, I mean, in order to be a medium, I, I think, in, in the way I see it is that you start out as having some type of abilities and it progresses, but it's like a muscle. It's like if you use it, then it will develop into this beautiful gift. But if you don't use it, it's not like it ever goes away because, like, like you've always said, David, that you try not to use it and then you have um, your spirit guides hitting you on the back of the head like, hey, come on, let's, let's get going here. So I think it's, it's a muscle. Like if you use it, it becomes this beautiful gift. And that's, that's what I like. Yes, I agree. And I believe that we do use psychic tools for mediumship, such as clairvoyance, clairaudience, claircognizance, and so forth and so on, which I myself... I'm clairvoyant, claircognizant, I, you know, like telepathic. Occasionally I'm clairaudient, and, you know, I wanted to ask Chip about his clairvoyance, he's clairaudient and clairsentient. I wanted to ask him about the clairvoyance, Chip. Do uh, you see pictures, signs, symbols, different things like that when you do readings? Yeah, a lot of the times I do. You know, it's very interesting the way that, that messages come to me. And sometimes I say I wish that I had, you know, like a, a projector inside my head that I could project what I'm seeing or hearing to other people so they could see what's actually, what, how actually those messages are, are coming to me inside my head. They come to me kind of like an afterthought, and it doesn't feel like it belongs to me. It feels like it's just kind of downloaded into my brain or into my consciousness. And sometimes it comes with, you know, just an image. Sometimes it comes with uh, a, a little short blip of a video. And sometimes it comes with um, just kind of like a message or a thought. Like, I think my spirit partners know that I'm very into movies. I've watched a lot of movies and listened to a lot of music and songs and read a lot of books. So they'll frequently use lines from movies or scenes from movies or, or, or song lyrics or quotations from books or different things that happened to me in my own past or that I've witnessed 
as examples of what at that point in time I should be talking to my client about. So it comes in a variety of different ways for me. Um, hearing sometimes, although it's not like hearing with my human ears, I will tell you in uh, preaching to the choir or the converted here, I know, but it's like I've heard it, but it's I didn't really hear it. It's like the afterthought, the knowledge of having almost heard something, not as though somebody's leaning over and place to bring something in my ear. It's different than that. Um, clairsentient for me means that, you know, if I go into an area or I'm around someone, it's a little different for me than being an empath, but it's feeling the circumstance or the emotion or the, the, the energy around a person, place, or a thing. That, that's amazing. I've talking to, spoken to a lot of uh, mediums, and they all have similar ways of doing, you know, using their abilities, and you just described pretty much exactly, very few people are on the same page as me. Uh, that's exactly myself. The same way you get it, I can I can go in the area and sense if there's something there or not. But if I'm doing a reading, I won't get a headache or a pain in the chest if somebody died that way. I, rarely I have, and then I will occasionally hear voices or sounds or something like that. One time I heard a barking dog, you know. But <laughs> most, but my clairvoyance, I get archetypes as well, or videos or pictures, just like you do. I think that's really interesting because people ask all the time you know because they obviously they're not seeing anything and they they always question that that's why i wanted to bring that up because i think that's what that's one of the most interesting aspects of, of what we do besides the help that we give other people but before i go into that i want to ask you you mentioned earlier about ghost whisper and you brought up a good point that of course she had some ability but there are mediums out there that are per se a ghost whisperer. They just see, like Peter James, for example, claimed that he saw only ghosts and that's it. He didn't see spirits that have went through the light. And there are some mediums that say they can see spirits that went through the light, but they can't see ghosts. Now I can do both, and obviously you can. What can you tell us about that, and why why is that way with some mediums and not others? Do you have any idea? I think that just as you said that every person's intuitive abilities is kind of like a snowflake or a fingerprint. Maybe not to that extreme, but you know what I'm, do you know the point I'm trying to make? I believe that different people can manifest different abilities and different shades of abilities. Some people are great at communicating with animals. I can do that, but I don't think it's my strongest skill set. Some people prefer to do forensic psychic work, I know that's not an area that I want to devote myself to for a variety of different reasons. Um, there are people who want to, you know, do this or do that, see auras, you know, do um, any sort of any sort of somatic intuition of doing things with, you know, talking about what's going on inside a person's body or being aware of, of scanning and reading a person's body, uh, internal body organs or external body or uh, body problems such as, you know, uh, a, a problem with, uh, you know, hair falling out, I don't know, any number of things that are, that are somatic and related. Um, they, 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 they present differently and, and it doesn't invalidate one over another. Um, yes, I see people who have passed, who have passed on and crossed over into the light or gone to the afterlife. I call those entities as spirits. I call those that have not made that transition ghosts for whatever reason they've elected to stay on the earth plane. And that's the way I differentiate and 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 call the names that I use for those sorts of entities. And. I think one of the things that I've seen recently is there's been a huge upsurge uh, during investigations that I've been on where there have been a lot of people that, oh, we've got to cross the spirit over, we've got to play Ghost Whisperer, we've got to be Melinda Gordon from Ghost Whisperer and cross that spirit over, they're in such need. Well, just because that ghost is staying on this plane, maybe that ghost, that soul is fulfilling some sort of some part of its destiny by remaining here. Maybe it has a purpose for staying here. It doesn't necessarily mean because someone hasn't completed that transition that they're a lost soul or they're trapped here on the earth plane. Maybe they're fulfilling a part of their soul's destiny by remaining where they are for the for, for in this time and in this place. 
I, I totally agree. Free will on this side and free will on the other side. We we don't know what their path is, and unless one of those ghosts asks us for help, if they're perfectly happy with where they're at, why should we try to force them to the other side? That's common sense. Well, you know what? There's a word that's a big word, but if you look it up, it's called anthropomorphism. And anthropomorphism is typically related to dogs or other animals that we ascribe human emotions and human feelings to a dog or a cat or a, another type of animal or an inanimate object or, you know, in this instance, we might become what can be called anthropomorphic with a ghost or a spirit. You know, how do we, why, why should we assume, assume that that energy, just because it's there, is, number one, trapped or, or needs our help to cross over and, you know, isn't it a little bit egotistical to think that we can do anything to make that happen when I think what we can do is we can say, you know, if your time is right here, what I always do is say, you know, if you are ready to do this, if you feel the time is right, I suggest that you look around, you look for a light, perhaps, or go to the place, finish your transition, cross over. If that's in your soul's best interest at this point in time, I would suggest that you seek out angels if they're around you or call them in to you if you can and finish your transition if you are ready to do so. I could have said it better, and that makes total sense. And if I may bring back, go back a little bit, rewind a little bit, I just wanted to mention once again, I've get, I've tried, I've tested the waters in different areas such as, you know, had people ask me to help solve crime cases. I've tried that a little bit, uh, scanned people's bodies, told them where there was issues at, and I can go on and on. But I prefer, especially since, you know, being in law enforcement, not to do any of that searching for um, missing people or going into crimes or going into people's bodies about illnesses. I mean, you know, a doctor... If you go see a doctor, he's not going to be a pediatric specialist, a brain surgeon, eyes, ears, nose, and throat. They just can't do all that, so they specialize. Well, I, that's myself, too. I just specialize in psychic mediumship, doing readings, writing, and talking. And so I understand your point, which you were talking about earlier. I just wanted to bring that up again. I thought that was an excellent point. Because well, David, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, and I, pardon me for interrupting you, but you brought up the whole forensic work. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, you know, people have leveled that against me and said, well, why don't you, you know, go out and solve crimes or help find missing persons or whatever like that. Well, here's my reason behind that. You know, there are a lot of psychics out there that feel comfortable doing that and going on television and talking about their work or openly admitting that they're doing this type of work. I'm not comfortable doing that, and I'll tell you that part of it is, is, is self-preservation. Here's the reason. If you've got an unsolved murder or you've got a missing person, chances are there's been some sort of foul play that's gone on there with a murder, almost def uh, well, definitely with a murder. If you've got a missing person, the odds of there being some sense of foul play are pretty, pretty high. Um, that means that if I'm going out and helping to try, especially in a public way, to solve that crime or give information that may help law enforcement find the perpetrator, that perp's still out there on the loose. And basically what that does, if I go public and it's known that I'm helping law enforcement and that perpetrator or perpetrators feel that I may be able to give information that can, can bring them to justice or finger them, if you will, here's the deal. That paints the bullseye right on me. It does. That's an excellent point. Yeah, that's great. You know, you're in law enforcement. Am I wrong? No, you're correct. No, you're correct. That is correct. You know, basically what that does is that makes me a target. And although in my home I have a, a really killer, you know, a, a silent alarm system on my house, and my house is protected by a lot of excellent video equipment from every angle where if someone tries to come in my house, They've had it. I have four very loving dogs to most people as long as I'm home, but if I'm not here or I'm asleep, those dogs, and there, there are three big ones and one small one, and they all are going to have big voices and will let me know. And second of all, they've got big, big teeth, and they can take off an arm very easily. So plus that, 
I've got a 38 six shot on my bedside table. Thank you. Know, I'm glad you're exercising your rights, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I don't want people to think that firearms are evil. Is is uh, firearm is an inanimate object. Is just a user. And if I may move on to another question, Chip. You know, I I grew up as a Catholic, but we were a strict Catholic family. But my family was pretty much open-minded. And I found that, um, I've had people ask me, you know, how does religion, well, I don't practice religion right now, but how does it affect what I do? And I tell them that it really doesn't, you know, affect it. And besides that, there's over, you know, 300 religions on the earth, at least, that I know of. But I was wondering, a lot of people, like, for example, medium John Holland is a religious person, but he has no problem, you know, using his gifts and all that. So I don't think there should be a problem with that. Do you? I don't think there's a problem with it. Are you asking, do I think that it's wrong to use your mediumship? No, I'm just asking how you feel about that. About, you know, I was raised Catholic too, and, you know, I've been, there have been times when I've heard from, I'm sure, well-meaning Catholics, both clergy and lay persons say, oh, well, you know, you're sending and going as God. Well, you know, my relationship with God is, very personal and profound, and no one's business to tell me how that should should be established, maintained, or formulated. I, you know, it's basically butt out. It's none of your business what my relationship with God is. You know, I've been threatened by people in the Catholic Church, again, clergy or lay persons, with, well, you talk to, you know, you talk to dead people, and that's really against the Church, and you uh, ask people to come to you as clients, in order to talk to dead people. So that's against God, that's against the Bible, blah, 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 blah. So we're going we're gonna to seek to have you excommunicated from the church. And shall I tell you what my response was? Go right ahead. Bring it. Oh, I love it. Love so it. Like, bring it. So what? Here's the deal. So I don't care if you go straight to Pope Benedict. And he officially excommunicates me from the church. I don't care. Here's the deal. What are you going to do? You're going to make me persona non grata in every Catholic church on the face of the planet? Are you going to put my picture in the entranceway and and put a, and, and not allow me admittance? You know, excuse me, but kiss my far lower back because I'll go in and take the sacraments anytime I want to. That's amazing that you said that. You know, I find it's funny. A lot of religions will teach about the afterlife, but they won't let you prove it. And some books that I've, I've read, and because I'm a researcher, I have tons of books here, then I found out that they're actually, and they kind of keep it on the mum, a lot of Catholic priests that are mediums that do use it, and even sisters as well, that are psychic mediums that actually uh, practice or it. Yes, there you go. <clears throat> you know, I know, I've known Catholic priests that were totally against. Here's, here's three different examples for you of Catholic priests that I've known. There was a Catholic priest that I knew that came up to me when I went to get some medals blessed at... Uh, a local, uh, a local church, and evidently he knew me, or or somehow came up to me and said, um, "I know that you talk to dead people, and that's against the Catholic Church. And did you know that you could be excommunicated and tried to to sway me into stopping that practice and whatever?" And I'm like, "Father, I understand that you have that you are well-meaning, and I appreciate that you would want to do this for me, but." You know, I'm just going to have to tell you that I don't need your ministry today. Um, right. The, the second instance was, there's a priest that came up to me and said, I think you're brilliant for what you do, and you are in God's grace. And a third instance, when I was working here in Georgia at a metaphysical store, um, doing some readings back in the very early days of, of doing the work that I do professionally, um, a priest and his boyfriend came into the shop to have a couple's astrology chart done. So, you know, there are a variety of different viewpoints within the Catholic Church for how to deal with things that are considered spiritual or paranormal. Right. That's amazing. And they have Catholic priests that are specialists uh, in exorcism 
they're exorcists, and I've read, I have some books that I've been studying about that. And so, you know, in, even in the religion itself, the priests, there's two camps. They used to uh, teach that at the Vatican, um, depend on, depending upon who the Pope was. I think, think that's very interesting. And I'm talking about that is going to lead to something else I wanted to ask you about. And that is uh, dark entities. Now, it's, from my experience, most places I've been to, you know, and I have encountered some powerful angry spirits or ghosts, if you will, and very rarely encounter what I would call a non-human entity of the dark energy type or what some people would call a demon. Mm -hmm. And I think those are perhaps, they exist, but they're ultra rare compared to most of the spirits or ghosts that I encounter are benevolent. And some of the humans that have crossed over, you know, you bring your personality with you, you might be a jerk, so there might be a, a benevolent type personality. Right. But the worst would be an inhuman dark entity, which I find that are there, perhaps rarely encountered. But what's your take on that? Um, I agree that when we, we pass over that, the personality remains. And I believe that in certain instances, if you were a, a mean-spirited jerk when you were in this life until your soul finds some sort of retribution or, or, or you are reformed or soul-integrated, pick a word, I believe that maybe you'll remain that way for a time. And especially those who have not crossed over completely, if they are still in the earth plane, you know, they're the ones that can cause the most problems because they've carried their nasty personalities with them and they're remaining, they're remaining here on the earth plane as, as incomplete with their transition. So I believe that that's the case. You know, sometimes you can have a nasty, a nasty entity that is a human entity. And in other instances, you may have something that, for whatever reason, is a non-human entity of anything from a very minor infestation to an extreme infestation that can be there as, you know, oppression, possession. So there's a variety of different things that can happen. But in a lot of instances, I tell people, really, if you have a demon there, in, in short, you're probably going to see some telltale signs of the fact that this is some sort of demonic infestation rather than just you know, a, a, a grumpy ghost. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that. And I believe that if it's a ghost and it, there's a poltergeist activity, meaning a uh, noisy ghost or a ghost that can move objects, then if it really is a ghost that it could, you know, move pictures and small items, and if it's not a human entity, but perhaps like a demon one, and the uh, haunting is really you know, snowball to a, a bigger point to where it, it can move large furniture whereas a human ghost cannot because it has stronger energy. People were asking me about that. That's why I wanted to bring that up. Now, go ahead. One of the things I will say is before we, before we move on is the fact that it's, when I was a boy growing up, and I don't know how old the two of you are, but I'm in my 50s, and I will tell you that when I was younger, if you thought you lived in a haunted house or were, were, were pretty sure you lived in a house where there was some sort of activity going on, you really kept that information pretty close to the desk. You may have told certain family members or close, close friends, but you certainly didn't announce it openly and publicly for fear of being, you know, thought to be crazy or uh, consorting with the devil or whatever that thought may have been. And now the interesting thing about it is that to live in a haunted house or to go to a haunted location or, and this is the thing that's most surprising to me, or to have a house that's demonically infested has almost become fashionable. Yeah, that's just too bad, you know, that, that people have to look at it that way. Hopefully, as people get educated, you know, with shows like yours, that they can see that that's wrong to make that fashionable. There's nothing... Nobody needs to have that type of attention. I don't know what's wrong with people, but if they were to experience it, uh, it just, I can't imagine it being anything that anybody would be proud of. 
Well, what I continually tell people is, you know, I'll get calls from folks all the time that say, you know, I've got noises in the house. I hear footsteps in the house. I hear whispering in the house. I smell cologne in the house. Things move in the house. And I go, yeah. And, you know, if you're not smelling foul odors in your house, if things are being thrown around viciously, if you're not being somehow psychologically or physically attacked, you know, there are some, like I said, some telltale signs when you should really put yourself on high alert or seek proper help. If you've just got simple things that are going on in your house, ghosts and, ghosts and spirits are everywhere. You know, chances are what you've got with simple things that go on are a garden variety mom and pop type ghost in your house, nothing that is malicious or threatening usually benevolent or at least benign. And, you know, that being said, you have to be you have to be a firm homeowner and let them know that, you know, they're in your home, in your space, and, you know, please don't misbehave, just like you would kind of deal with someone who was uh, a human in your house and was being an errant house guest. That, that's right. That's that makes a lot of sense. It really does. Now, if I could ask you another question, you've done thousands of readings. I mean, probably over 30,000 readings or so. Uh, do you have a, a memorial, you know, a memorable reading that you can recall? I know none of us can remember our readings, but is there one reading that was special that touched your heart or that was really interesting that you can remember off the top of your head from my ask? Yeah, there have been a lot. I stopped counting after a while. I you know, I tried to, to have some sort of estimate in my head of how many readings I've done and I've done a variety of different readings. I've done public readings at events. I've done private readings for clients. I've done you know, readings on radio shows and, and when I would take call ins and, you know, there's just been different lengths and forms and styles of readings I've done for people, so I really, I don't even know how many, but you're right, it, it has been thousands of people I've read for. But here's, here's a couple of examples that I can give you. Um, my assistant, Rebecca, and I first met when she came to me for a reading. She wanted me to contact her grandmother. I do direct contact readings, not open channeling, where I allow any spirit to come through. I prefer for a person to just give me three pieces of information, the name of the person they want me to contact, and all they've got to give me is the first name, the first name of the person they want me to contact, the relationship they have with that person, and how long it's been since they passed, and I will reach out energetically and try to pull that energy into us. And that is the way that I do readings. Well, Rebecca wanted me to contact her grandmother, and I gave her some very basic information about her grandmother and then some exact information about her grandmother. We actually, I told her where, she came to me to try to locate a ring that her grandmother had given her that was missing and I gave her exact details about where the ring was. It was in a jewelry box that had a blue lining and it was near a place where the rug was pulled away from the wall or there was a, car, a rug or something that moved around on the floor. And she said there was nothing like that in her house. But later in talking to her father, he said, that sounds like your mother's jewelry box upstairs. It's a built-in jewelry box that's got a blue liner in it, whereas yours has got a, a, a velvet-colored red liner in it. And, you know, we just put a rug up there not long ago that we call the traveling rug because every time you step on it, it's not, you know, it, it slips on the floor and it travels around. So Rebecca said that, Dad, I haven't had that ring at Mom's house. It wouldn't be in her jewelry box. Well, lo and behold, they went and looked in that jewelry box, and there was the ring. That's one and, wow. and and during that reading, you know, that's pretty exact information. And during that reading, Rebecca had a drop in, a drop, which doesn't often happen with me, but she had a drop in spirit. And during that drop in, he identified himself as Ralph. Rebecca had no idea who Ralph was, and she said, "Can he tell me more?" And he told me three pretty distinct things. And I'm going to give you the first two, which can be considered, yeah, well, whatever. And, but the third one is very specific, and I'll explain. The first thing that Ralph told me was that he had had a house fire at one point in time. There had been a fire at his house. The second thing he told me was that there was an interesting story about underground water or wells. And the third thing he showed me was spitting, chewing tobacco into someone's hand. Now, 
Now, let me say that for you again. Spitting chewing tobacco into someone's hand. Now, how random is that? No, that's, that's very specific. That's pretty specific and random. Yeah. Rebecca thought, Rebecca thought, you know, he's out of his mind. He hit on a few things, but he's, you know, gone way off course here. But, again, in talking to her dad, she mentioned this spirit that dropped in, and he goes, Rebecca, I know who that is. And she says, you do? And he said, yeah, I do. That's my Uncle Ralph, your great Uncle Ralph. And she goes, you've never mentioned him. And he goes, well, you know, I don't know why you've never heard about him or you may not remember, but, you know, Rebecca, I just have to tell you that what Chip said makes sense, and I'll tell you why. When I was a boy, Uncle Ralph's house burned down. And Uncle Ralph, Uncle Ralph taught us how to, to use a willow reed to do what we call water witching or divining for water underground. That was the underground water story. And he said, and as obscure as what Chip said about spitting tobacco in someone's hand, Uncle Ralph chewed tobacco, and when we were boys, he would trick us and say, if you close your eyes, I'll give you a prize. And he would close our eyes and hold out our hands, and he would spit chewing tobacco in our hands. Oh, spirits do have humor. <laughs> So I hate to tell you this, but those who say that I'm just cold reading or pulling any sort of information or any other medium is that can be, you know, relate to anybody, I would dare them to say that that sort of information was just something I could pull out of thin air or pull out of my butt. Yeah, that's right. You, you spent a trillion dollars looking up the history of six and a half billion people, so you're ready to go. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, here's the deal. You know, I, many of my clients... Uh, that that I see at events, I don't I don't know who they are. I don't know anything but their first names, nothing about them. And you know, yeah, I, 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 if I did this blindfold, and maybe maybe someone would say that was a cold reading. But then again, the majority of the readings that I do are on the phone with my clients, and anyone who's had a reading with me will tell you pretty much that I say, don't give me a lot of information unless I ask you for it. And I stop my clients a lot. But probably two of the most valuable things that have been said to me that have touched my heart the most, folks, has been this. I had someone tell me once that, you know, she had turned away from God after the death. She had blamed God and railed at God for the, in, in her grief at the death of, I believe it was her mother. And I told her, I sort of ministered to her, which I don't always do, but I sort of reached out to her and said, this is a time when I really feel that you can turn to God more than anything in spiritual counseling to her said, you know, I do really think that you can turn back to God and ask God to help you heal your heart and heal your grief. And a few months later, she reached back out to me and said, I want you to know that you read for me and suggested that I turn back to God, and I must tell you that you led me home to God. That's wonderful. And the other thing that was said to me once by someone was, after a reading, I'm, I'm known to be at times very blunt with the readings I give. That's the way my spirit partners are. They know that that's my personality, and I think that they utilize that, and they know that I'm not going to be cruel to my class, but I am going to be telling and blunt, and I think what they sometimes know is that I will tell it like it is, and one of my clients had that sort of a reading with me and came back to me and said, you know, Chip, one session with you did more good for me than years of psychotherapy. And isn't that true? That is so amazing. You, you did a, an awful lot for them. So there's a lot more to the gift of mediumship than, than people think. You know, it, it involves a lot of areas, and it really does help people in many ways. And I wanted to ask you one last question about this area before I move on to the next. Yeah. Is uh, what do you tell people in a reading that they come to you and I want to reach my mother and spirit and without telling you a lot of information, but come to find out that this person is thinking that their mother is angry at them because they did visit him in a hospital. Well, she did, and then she had an argument with her, and she meant to go back to visit her again, but the last time she visited her in the hospital, she had an argument with her, and before she could make it back again to make up, the mother passed away, and now she's feeling all guilty. You know, I, and one of the things I'll do, I'll, if the person tells me that this is the case with the parent, you know, I'm feeling this, I'll reach out and ask the spirit in no uncertain terms, is, is she right or is she wrong? Is he right or is he wrong? Are you still angry? Are you still upset about this circumstance? 
And in those instances, that person in spirit will tell me, no, I'm, I'm not really angry about that. It happened the way it happened. And you can't go back and change the past. You can't go back and rewrite history. It happened that way. And, you know, I don't want that person to feel, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda, regret, remorse, grief, guilt about that circumstance. I'll tell you one thing that did happen to me, though. This is kind of an interesting thing. A woman came to me once with her son for and for a birthday present. He gifted his mother with a, a live session when I did sessions live before I began only doing phone readings privately. And he brought his mother, and they both brought tape recorders to record the reading with me. And we they turned on the tape recorders, and I tried to reach out to her husband, her late husband, and the, the young man's father, and I couldn't get anything, which is fairly unusual for me. Pretty much, I always get something. And I was getting so little, he just was not going to come through. I mean, just little teeny blips of things, but he came across as being very distant and very much um, not willing to come through and, and associate himself with this process. And when I said, wow, I, you know, I need to refund your money because I don't know what's going on here. I, this is just, this, this almost never, I mean, almost never happens with me. And then they tell me the story that the, husband, the wife had caught the husband cheating on her with his secretary. Um, and he, had, he had gone out to their boat house when she said, I'm going to take you to the cleaners and ruin you. I'm going to take every cent you've got. If you don't give me a good settlement, all this is going to come out. I'm going to divorce you and you're going to do well by me, or I'm going to ruin you professionally and personally. So she threatened him in an ugly situation. And one day, out of whatever, he went out into, the, into their boathouse and stuck a gun to his head and killed himself. And at his funeral, she told him, I, you know, this is the most cowardly thing that you could have done. You know, here's the deal. You know, I didn't want you in life, so don't you dare come back to me in death. And he took her at his word. Wow, he sure did. He took her at her word by, you know, if she said that to him, he, why should he come back during a reading yet, you know, and, and the, 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 the period at the end of the story is when both the, the, the son and the mother, the, the wife, played back their tape recordings of the session we did together, do you know what was on the tape? On both tapes, not one tape, what? but both tape recorders. No voices. All you heard on both tape recorders, on both tapes and tape recorders, was <laughs> static. That's amazing. Wow. Well, that's wow. the way people are. It goes to prove that you know your your energy, your feelings, your personality does survive after death, and that's the way it is. That's totally amazing. Now, Chip, uh, because we're getting close to running out of time. Uh, I want to ask you, before I ask you about your events and other things, uh, you know, we love animals, and you have some cute little dogs. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I have four dogs that were rescued from various states of horrific circumstance. Um, I'm a strong animal rights advocate and try to do as much rescue as I can and support rescue organizations and help animals as often as I can, dogs and cats and horses and, you know, I, I try to do as much as I can, and and it breaks my heart to see any form of abuse on domesticated animals. It, it it's it's horrific that that happens. Um, I you know I've got one laying in the room here with me that had cancer two years a little over two years ago, and I spent a considerable amount of money to get her healthy, and she's sitting over here right now saying, "Hey, when do we when are we going to have a, a little dinner here?" So you know. <laughs> She's, she's in the mood for ringing the dinner bell at this point in time. My Molly is sitting over here, and she's like, okay, get off that blasted phone and, and give me a treat. <laughs> That's cute. Yes, animals really do bring a lot uh, to our, you know, in our lives. They sure bring a lot with us. They're so lovely. They're my family, and I miss them when I'm on the road. Oh, I bet. Oh, yeah. Now, talking about on the road now, first, before I talk about that, on your website, it says that you are coming out with a book. I am very happy to say that I am, my first book is going to be published by Major Publishing House. Uh, and the book, from what I understand, will be available sometime. You know, these dates are flexible. And, and 
we're still in the beginning process of getting everything all ironed out and dates all set. But from what I understand, the book is going to be available to the public sometime within the first half of 2012. So that's what I, I gather at this point in time with everything that needs to be done. Probably about 12 to 14 months in the future, I would say, the book is going to be out. So there's still a while left before that happens. But yes, my first book is going to be published uh, in 2012. And I guarantee you that we're going to order some copies of that for sure, because I always like to order extras for gifts. And talking about On a Road, which brings to another thing, you, you have, are going to be traveling very shortly. That's where we're very fortunate to have you on the show here tonight, because you're going to be leaving pretty soon and going be going all around the United States, because you have uh, some special events planned. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I do. Um, on the 24th, I start out my long haul of travel with an event in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania called Phenomenology, and I'm there for a weekend, and I come home for a few days and head out for a 13-city tour that includes, and I'll just run through the cities really fast for you, two shows in San Francisco. We sold the first one out, and we added another one that is like got five tickets left. Then to L.A., San Diego, Phoenix, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Miami, Florida, the Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg area of Florida, back to Atlanta, and a home stop for a few days, then to Louisville, Kentucky, and finishing up in Oklahoma City. I get to stay home for a few days, and then I get to go to an event at the Mount Washington Hotel, somewhere in between, actually, no, I, I, in between all that travel I just mentioned, I just stop at the Mount Washington Hotel in New Hampshire, and then after I come home from that last event, there's uh, a reality, a beyond reality event, or a beyond events event at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado. There's Through the Veil, which is here in Atlanta, a wonderful event. You're coming to that, correct? We're, right now, we're uh, coming to the San Francisco one that we have planned at this time. I thought maybe you were going to be at the Through the Veil event. I, I, you guys should think about that. It's in June, and then you know, on my on my calendar, I've got another event in September with my dear friend Patty Starr at Scare Fest in Lexington, Kentucky. So, lots of traveling and lots of event work, trying to juggle everything that's coming up in the next few months. Okay, I'll put that down for Atlanta for sure, and I want to let everybody know that's listening if they go to chipcoffee.com and go to his own page, there's a link to events and public appearances. There's a lot of information on there if you want to find out more about any of his events. And I would suggest that if you're interested, you look really soon because his tickets to his events are selling rapidly and some of them are already sold out. Am I correct, Chip? Some of them are, are sold out. Yeah, we've already sold out two events. We sold out San Antonio and we sold out one night in um, San Francisco, the second San Francisco night. It's very close to sold out. Some of the other cities are moving really rapidly and quickly moving toward a sold out status. So I would suggest to people that if you really want to want to attend the event and you're able to do so, purchase your tickets, you know, fairly soon because uh, they are they are selling well. That's that's good. That's wonderful because you know the amazing work that you do. We all see you on TV and watch shows over again, and you help a lot of people. Uh, and you do more for people than the public realizes. You know, behind the scenes, you've you've uh, done things like, for example, on the uh, Psychic Kids TV series. That you there's so many ways that you're helping the children there, and a lot of people don't know that even some of the families there. And I won't go into too much detail about that may have had some issues, and you've went the extra mile to help them. You know, from the goodness of your heart, I mean, you're such a, a wonderful person. I can't, you know, say enough about it. And you really well, have to show me a lot. You yeah. know, and that's just the whole thing. There's a lot of things that you know people can people can think they know who you are completely, but um, a television persona and who someone is on television isn't the totality of necessarily who they are in person or how they behave. So you know, I think that that you know. Unless someone, unless someone has, knows me intimately, don't don't judge me. That's right. And, and Chip, I want to say that you have nothing but love in the chat room. Everyone is encouraging. They're thanking you for all the work that you're doing with um, with all the groups of people.
people that you're working with and a lot of people are going to your website, they're excited that you're traveling around so that people can see you in different places and uh, because the people in chat are all over the United States and some outside the United States. So well, much love really to everybody in your chat room. You, you and David are, uh, are such gracious, gracious people. And I just appreciate you giving me a chance to come on and communicate with you and your audience tonight. Well, thank you very much. It was our pleasure indeed. Like I said, this is a positive show. And a lot of people are listening. The uh, listening audience is growing. The uh, basis of our show is to bring information from different professionals to the listeners because we like to think outside the box. So we present different people's uh, ideas and skills and information to all our listeners there. We're non judgmental on this show, and we like to believe that somebody can learn something from each show and, and enjoy the, a nice hour each night. And uh, I'm, I'm telling you, this is really, you've been a, a wonderful guest. You have a lot of information and you're a wonderful person. And we, I wish you great success in everything that's coming up. And we can't, Sherelle and I can't wait to see you when you come to San Francisco. It's going to be wonderful if the, time, if the days are kicking by, aren't they? We'll, we'll, we're going to be able to give each other big hugs, you guys, uh, all of us. Finally. Person. I know. Yes. <laughs> Finally. You know, it's, like, it's like, all right, come on, baby. Let's, 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 let's get it on here. Let's get it by. That's right. We're looking forward to that. And so thank you so much for coming on. And go ahead and give your doggies a treat and a meal and a and relax yourself. Thank you so much, Chip. Uh, and if anybody's interested, don't forget to go on Facebook and join this fan page. He's also on Twitter and YouTube. So thank you, Chip. Good thank night. You God bless you. Thank you so much, Chip. See you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Well, Sherelle, that was uh, Chip was fantastic. And thank you, everybody in the chat room and everybody for listening. This show will be archived should you want to listen to it again. Thank you once again for joining us on Beyond the Gate Radio, where we take you beyond the gate. And don't forget, next week uh, we're going to have Charles Gillius, who is an extra-large medium and a cartoonist. He will be with us on the show next Sunday. Thank you, everyone in chat. Uh, much love to all of our family and friends in chat and on the air and listening. We appreciate your support. Thank you for your support. And uh, we also would like to thank, I'd like to thank David for also being here and giving us his good feedback. David, thank you. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you for coming to Beyond the Gate. Good night and God bless. Good night. Everybody, and welcome to Beyond the Gate Radio, where we take you each week beyond the gate. Tonight, your hosts are myself, David Baker, and my lovely wife, Sherelle. Sherelle, how are you doing tonight? Actually, I'm doing well, thank you. Um, it's raining here, but that's okay. Um, it needs to wash away all the soot out of the air and everything, so I'm doing great. How are you doing? Wonderful. Yes, the rain is wonderful cleansing energy. We appreciate that. God has given us many gifts, and that is one of them. And without water, we wouldn't be here today. So our show next Sunday, I want to get this out of the way briefly, is going to be medium Charles A. Phileas. 
Charles Phyllis is a psychic medium. He's the author of On the Wing and a Prayer, and he's also a comedian and cartoonist. And some of his work is on display at the Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, California. Tonight's guest, which everybody's been waiting for, I can see that there's a lot of people listening to the show at this time, is none other than Chip Coffey, Psychic Medium, starring on TV Psychic Kids and the Paranormal State. Thousands of people worldwide have turned to Chip Coffey in their time of need. Chip Coffey is a clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient psychic, as well as a fully conscious medium. He is the great-grandson of famed Native American medicine woman, Minnie Sue Morrow Foster, whose own amazing gifts were widely hailed in the early part of the 20th century. Chip is blessed to have the God-given ability to provide others with insight, guidance, and direction. As a medium, he is also able to reconnect his clients with loved ones who have crossed over. A firm believer in God and his angels, Chip believes that miracles great and small happen each and every day. And isn't that true? I like the saying that Chip has on his website, which is chipcoffee.com. Right at the top there it says, no fear, no doubt. And you know, I find that to be uh, a very powerful statement in this type of work that we do. And now I'd like to bring on our very special guest tonight, Chip Coffey. Chip, good evening, sir. How are you doing? And welcome to the Beyond the Gate Radio. David, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And hello, Sherelle. Thank you, Chip. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How's it going out there? You know, I'm sitting at home in Atlanta, and it's a lovely evening. Um, I must admit that we turned our clocks ahead this morning, and all of us, or most of us did, and uh, here in the U.S., and this time change when we spring forward kind of messes with my internal alarm clock a bit, so I don't know what time my internal alarm clock feels like it is right now, but certainly not 9 o'clock on the East Coast. That's true. That's true. I, I, it takes me like an extra day to get it together. Oh, it takes me longer than that. It usually takes me at least a few days to adjust to, you know, my, my system to the fact that, you know, the, the, the time and the light has all changed around a bit and, you know, there's a difference in, in the rhythm and the pattern of the way that um, types of abilities and, and read the biographies and the histories of different people who have worked in that, that these realms. As well as my parents, my parents were always very supportive. They didn't have a problem with their belief systems incorporating, you know, anything that was anything that was paranormal. That's that's truly amazing. And you know, something I've found to be true: there are many people that choose to use their gifts in different ways. And I've never said that one is better than the other, or just because one psychic medium or psychic does one thing differently than another, that they're better than the other. It's just that everybody have different ways of using the gift, such as you said, with through tea leaves or cards or whatever method they may use. And I suppose cards, you mentioned playing cards. They weren't tarot or oracle cards. They were just playing cards. I suppose that when people do readings that way, it gives the sitter a visual effect, but in addition, I suppose they can concentrate or it gives them a tool for concentration to go beyond whenever they're doing the uh, reading with the cards. Right. Uh, it, it's, it, with Jane, she was very, you know, I, she just had a deck of regular, it was interesting, she had a deck of regular playing cards and she would just slip out the cards and they're on the table uh, in front of you and, you know, it was it was pretty amazing the things that she was able to, to tell you, and I mean, pretty exact things that were were pretty on target as far as, you know, what, what had happened to you, where you had been, what was happening in the present, what was happening down the road for you. It was, you know, it was, it was kind of startling, and especially to, you know, a 10, 11, 12-year-old boy that she was able to, the day moves along. So, you know, I, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm kind of hypersensitive to that. You know, that's funny you should mention that. I don't know if it's my Gemini energy or myself, but not only do I have to go through the ch time change 
at work last night, somebody said, oh, so-and-so's not getting a lunch because the time went forward. I said, oh, I'll just give it to him anyway. But I actually went out to check the mail today because my days off just recently changed as well. And I, I came back into the rain, I all wet, and I said, what an idiot. Today is not Saturday, it's Sunday. So I'm really discombobulated, but it's okay. I know. I, it happens like that to me sometimes because the days of the week blend in together, and I don't know. Sometimes I'll say, wow, this feels like a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Sunday or something like that. And I don't know what that's supposed to feel like, but in my own mind, I know that there are people that say that, wow, this doesn't feel like a Monday, this doesn't feel like a Friday. You know, so it's really funny how we say those sorts of things in this life. It certainly is. And I just want to mention one thing briefly to all the listeners. Thank you very much for listening to our show tonight. All of you are very important to us. And tonight we won't be taking any calls because Chip has been kind enough to uh, spend an hour of his precious time with us tonight, and we're going to make the very best of it. So once again, no calls, but you are welcome to listen. Thank you very much. And Chip, I want to ask you a question, if I may. For those that don't know a lot about you, or as far as your history goes, do right. you recall when you first discovered that you had some type of unusual abilities? Actually, my first memory as a child of what I guess I've come to know as psychic ability was very simple precognitive things, such as knowing when the telephone was going to ring sometimes, or being aware that someone was headed to our house for a visit when they were unannounced, they didn't announce themselves. So that was kind of the first recollection that I had as a child, a very small child, two or three years old, of knowing those sorts of things kind of intuitively. That's amazing. So you were born with the gift and you've had it all your life and it wasn't, did you, you feel that was normal? I know it runs in your family. Did you have anybody that would, uh, that you could talk to about that as you grew older? You mentioned my great-grandmother. That was my maternal great-grandmother, my mom's grandmother. That was uh, a Native American medicine woman and shaman. And she died many years before I was born. But my mother also had some some unique psychic abilities. Um, my grandmother on my dad's side, on the opposite side of the family, actually read tea leaves. So, you know, when they had a child that exhibited or manifested some evidence of, of having some sort of psychic ability or psychic gift, if you will, then they really weren't too thrown by that. Um, as I began to get older, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, by that time we had moved back to the state where I was born in New York from South Carolina where I was living at the time. And my mother had a dear friend whose name was Jane, and Jane was very in tune with spirituality and and metaphysics and, and the supernatural. And she was a lady who read a deck of regular playing cards and was also a handwriting analyst. And she was very instrumental in, in encouraging me to explore that psychic part of myself further and to read and study on different on different 